go all right so today I'm wanting to today I'm wanting to put forward a performance to begin <laughs> I can be so tricky so tricky that that initial moment for each of these this has been a challenge each time how to start how to start openly and I had to put up the mask, slam into it, and then take it off. So, I uh, earlier this evening I had a um, a really lovely chat with uh, someone who um, who introduced me to a particular arc of um, uh, hermetic practice. <laughs> I don't I don't know how. Um, the term hermetic has, has come to mean something very different for me than I think it does in um, uh, in standard English. Um, but it, it's one of the, what I'm referring to is one of the main strands of Western spirituality. There are, um, largely speaking, two main strands. There's the, there's Christianity has been the big one, um, but like monotheistic religion, the, the uh, Abrahamic religious thread is one of them. And the other one being um, what's been relegated mostly to the occult, uh, sort of the, the, the refusion of those two resulted in a whole lot of the modern new age and uh, new thought, law of attraction, all that stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, yoga, <laughs> we, as practiced in the West, is basically Western spirituality with a lot of, um, with borrowing a whole lot of, uh, well, it's inspired by Western spirituality and then brings in a whole bunch of things from Eastern yogic philosophy to, to talk about it. But a lot of the reason that it resonates the way it does is because of the way the translation maps onto a whole lot of Western spirituality. So there's, um, so I'm speaking with a fellow who had um, initiated me into the modern mystery school. This is part of my, uh, my uh, explorations into what can work, what's here, what, where is there a button? <laughs> where is there a button to save the world? Um, it feels very strange to, to say that, to, to hold on to the energy of that, to save the world. I feel like that's very central to what I want to talk about here. But I want to zoom in on this example. Um, I noticed in the course of talking with him, it was, it was difficult for me to set aside my own performative way of being. I found myself smiling, even though we were talking on the phone. This wasn't a Zoom call. And I um, found myself smiling and going, yeah, yeah, and then here's this interesting concept. And I went into a whole bunch of things um, of theory having to do with the tree of life. And I was focused on the ideas, and there was a part of me that was even whispering, hey, hey, you're, um, there's something funny going on here. I'm focusing more on ideas than on people. It didn't make it all the way to consciousness, even in the conversation to go, what is alive here? What's really true? I asked myself that, something like that a couple of times, but it had more to do with how do I navigate this interaction? rather than I am interacting with a being. How can I be really here and see what's here? I don't know what's here. Like that orientation is one I, I generally prefer. I think it's kinder to myself. Um, it ends up being kinder to the other person as well. And throughout that, I kept noticing that I would get these, um, these judgments that would pop up. They were familiar, they were stale. Um, things about, um, oh, this, like the way that the modern mystery school works has these kinds of mimetic flaws to it. And here's this analysis and, ah, this sounds like a money grab. This is weird. And, and, just, and like, even, even if some of that ended up being accurate, I was missing something pretty important and I was conscious of missing it. It was really kind of an odd experience to have a consciousness about, like I knew there was a machine going, but I was having trouble hitting the right pause button. There's a feeling of 
just feeling into it, how to articulate this. Like my, um, my intention, well, the, the thing that really lights up here is the fact that he is obviously more happy, more at ease, more readily loving than me in that moment. There's a gift of presence being offered and I was having a hard time receiving it. Whatever I think about the ideas, and I think a lot of the ideas are interesting. Some of them are kind of frustrating. There's something about, um, I don't know, there's a feeling almost like a multi-level marketing spirituality thing going on or something. I'm not quite, that's not the right word, but there, there was something funny going on in terms of the, the way that the philosophy gets put out that I, I can't quite put my finger on. Um, and I, and I, I want to take that as an example. There's something funny going on even in how I analyze that, that I want to highlight. And like, for instance, um, if, I, if he ends up watching this, there's some part of me that goes, oh, does this, does this hurt his feelings? And the fact that I would have to ask that afterwards highlights there's something funny going on here. And that's, that's what I want to capture, what I want to talk about here. Um, but to, the thing is that those judgments don't matter in an important way. They're, well, they do matter to the extent that they pull me away from the present moment and from the recognition of a kind of ease and grace that is in the connection, that is available in the connection, a gift being offered. So what's, what's the judgment about? <laughs> Um, another story that pops to mind. Um, when, God, this would have been around the turn of the 21st century. It's part of me that totally gets a kick out of that. Like, ah, I'm, I'm getting old enough that, that my, my, I can talk about the arc of time. Like, yeah, when, when I got to witness the turning of the second millennium. Right? <laughs> Something that tickles about that, watching the dawn of the 21st century. Like it's the third millennium? Yeah, that would be for sec yeah, technically the third millennium, the dawn of the third millennium. Um, <clears throat> um, but language aside, around 2000, 2001, um, I, uh, I started to connect with a person that um, so it really lit up my heart and being with a sense of the possibility of magic. And this is in the context of uh, Wicca. And I was uh, 18 at the time, I think. I had been, it was actually my, um, my last gasp. Like there was, there was very much a, um, like I had been trying to explore things relating to um, Wiccan magic uh, and, and things related to neo-paganism for quite a while in my teens. And uh, I kept, I kept finding things that were religious rather than truth. I didn't have the clarity of language or perception uh, or the wisdom or maturity to be able to sort through it. And on, all I could register is there were a bunch of people here who were claiming to be able to cast spells. And um, there was a kind of a dichotomy that seemed difficult, which is something like when you have a whole bunch of people who claim to be able to cast health and prosperity spells and they're all sick and they can't pay their rent. I, it, it's hard for me to take their claims of magical power seriously. Um, that was the kind of attitude that was very dominant in my perception, very clearly inherited from my father. And uh, there is a group of people who like neo-pagans um, practicing magic who were getting good results and were very practical about it, very intelligent. Um, and uh, it was based on a system of learning and practice and cutting through and switching correspondences that don't actually make sense and resonating with, well, how does the universe actually work? Not in terms of let's, let's refer to science because they weren't trying to do science, they were trying to do magic. They were trying to pull on strange forces to cause things to happen. I didn't have a theory of how magic works at the time. It was just, well, I probably did. I don't remember what it was. It was probably something a teenage version of me would have come up with. Oh, there's energy. 
that science, like well, it's not exactly energy, but some kind of stuff that science doesn't recognize because they're closed-minded. They're not paying attention to psi phenomena, something like that. Anyway, um, ended up having a really lit up sense of hope from this group. Um, and uh, uh, like they were way down in Portland. I was living near Seattle. So um, every month and a half, I would drive down to one of their events just to interact with them and to work with them and to build up the possibility of, yeah, I really want to learn this stuff. And um, right before I got to jump in with practicing the foundational bits that were supposed to let me be able to cast spells and so on, um, the, the leader of the group, who was the first main contact I had, my, my friend, ended up losing um, the ability to hold her dream house where all of these meetings had been held before and ended up having to move far east to be with like, like far east in the United States like into, into the Bible Belt um, to be with her husband's family because of financial difficulty and I started looking at this going uh, okay help me out here this looks bad and I wasn't exactly kind about it um, the, um, uh, like today I would, like if, if I encountered something like that today, if, if one of my teachers claiming to be able to have all kinds of financial magical power ended up having to, um, file for bankruptcy, I would check in with them. <laughs> like I would want to know, are you okay? What do you need right now? And because people are more important than ideas. Like what like that's this is an intense amount of stuff for somebody to be going through. So what's going on? And I'll I'll learn the truth. I don't have to worry about it. I'll figure it out. I don't have to judge them. I don't have to demand that they prove to me that they are worth my time. Um that was a kind of attitude I didn't even realize was basically where I was coming from in interacting with her while she was losing her home and having to and her friends and um, having to move uh, to a place that she didn't want to move to and she knew she was going to be uncomfortable in. Um, and so we had a big spat that ended up with us not talking for about a decade. So what did I gain even if I were right? In that whole exchange, like even if I were pointing out, hey, you know, you're talking about magic and magical power, but here is a clear empirical evidence that you're not doing the things that you think you can. What did I gain? Freedom from a wrong idea. And I just ejected these, uh, these, um, these mentally toxic people from my life, right? <laughs> because that's kind. I'm sure that really helped their situation while they were trying to orient to how to make meaning, how to flourish. If there had been magic there, then um, if there had been some kind of, by, by that I mean something like the, um, like either some form of actual power or um, even just a meaning-making system a way of orienting to life with a feeling like they're doing something meaningful. Either of those. My reaction would have contributed to its damage and loss. And then I could go off and be confident. So confident that I was right. As it was, that whole episode was extremely traumatic for me because I didn't want to lose these people as friends and I especially didn't want to lose the my main contact, the main woman who had introduced me to these things. There's just a lot of appreciation and admiration for what kind of promise she brought in. Um, but I just could not make the move that to me at the time felt like having to blindly believe stupid stuff in defiance of my own observation and senses in order 
to be able to lean in. So as I have a look at these cases, and, I, and there are many others too, like um, at one point I had a, um, um, you know, let me not let me not spend too much time on on more examples, but like there there are plenty there are plenty like this. Um, <laughs> one very clear one burst to mind. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so many examples of what I think. Excuse me, what I think uh, Perry Chase would call um, demonizing my teachers, demonizing people who had um, put forward a bunch of energy in support of me. And what do I gain by it? So on one level, it's a, this mechanical thing is very understandable. Um, to the extent that I do not see the entire fabric of reality all the way down to its finest nuances, that I do not recognize the eternal nature of my own consciousness and fully integrate that with my individuality as Michael. To the extent that I am shy of that at all, to the extent that I am shy of absolute compassion and fully enjoying this life, I am misperceiving things. I am a little lost. I believe things that are false. Sometimes I catch them. Just today, I was just, just dumbfounded about how easy it was for me to be hooked by a situation where someone had posted in a, in a private forum about having uh, her partner going through a lot of difficulty and the both of them being convinced that what they were dealing with was a demonic possession. But when she described what their interactions were and what his responses were, I looked at that and I went, this sounds to me like a psychotic episode. Um, and uh, there's a there's a phenomenon. And this is part of where this, this this same energy of judgment comes up. They're like, I'm wanting to put this forward, and I have a judgment, but I'm also trying not to own that judgment, and I want it to be reasonable. Well, like I, I do have an honest judgment. Um, honest in that. Let let me put this forward without the emotional post processing. Um, most of the talk about spirits and demons in most spiritual communities, I'm talking with, about fae and spirits of the forest and all of that is gibbering nonsense. It, it doesn't, I don't mean to say that people aren't having experiences with these things, but I mean that there's a, um, there's, there's a type of, there's a compression of layers of truth that happens that don't go together. It's trying to make five pancakes one pancake. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. There's, um, this is not to dismiss the reality of there being structures of intelligence that exist on different kinds of planes than human beings. Um, <laughs> there's, there's like me wanting to, to add a caveat saying um, something like, I am not agreeing with this. I'm disagreeing with everyone. Everyone's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, like when, when uh, back in August I talked about um, demons. Um, by demons I mean memes, but there's something important captured by the use of the word demon in that context where it is actually very natural to talk about these non-incarnate, the, the, these, these non-corporeal entities as though they have intention in the same, the, the, like the way that um, uh, um, uh, for instance, the, uh, the whole Black Lives Matter movement, the Black Lives Matter movement has an intelligence that isn't in any one of them. I mean, it kind of is in all of them. If, if the whole memetic structure leaves them, the thing continues almost untouched. 
it's like these are the cells of the organism. And if I scratch my skin and I lose some skin cells, it doesn't really change meaningfully how I work. So to the extent that we want to pretend that I can have intentions, memes can have intentions. And when you look at their intentions and how they move, there's a certain species of them, well, a genus, a certain genus of meme that I think is absolutely fair to call a demon. Possesses people, causes pain and suffering, it promises power, just sucks people into patterns that um, distract them and keep them, and, and, and <laughs> in a way, um, sometimes they can offer to take your soul in order to create what you think you want. Like this, absolutely, I think the, the legends of demons absolutely work for a certain type of meme. And they will exist on a different level than humans. Now that's a very, um, that's more accessible. I think there are even more subtle things going on that um, uh, information theoretic incorporeal entities are easy to talk about in a particular way. So we have to fight a little bit to point out, you know, you know, Mr. Staunch materialist, these incorporeal entities even exist in your paradigm. You can't get away from it. Um, but uh, when you start dealing with these energetics, these things of, well, when I subtly feel into it, there's something that it feels like to have the resonance of victimhood or the resonance of kindness. Some of these resonances have a self-perpetuating nature to them that actually fulfills the same structural laws as for memes. Which is to say, it's fair to talk about entities made of energy. But um, we're not quite ready to talk about that in, uh, in overly materialist circles. So we'll just pretend that we don't experience emotions. <laughs> So anyway, that's, that's, um, <sighs> yeah, so there's a whole arc. There's an arc of me being possessed. So even just trying to give an example, here's an example of judgment, <laughs> possession. <laughs> So in, in that situation with this person expressing these things about their partner, what I had seen is um, this looks to me more like um, one person having a psychotic episode while the other is leaning into a story that makes the whole thing feel meaningful and a little dramatic. And um, if they keep leaning in that direction, that's actually going to be really bad for the person who's going through a psychotic episode, if I'm right. Um, so I described, like, just said, I don't have enough context, but it sounds to me like your partner may be having a psychotic episode. Here's how you deal with that. The, these are my strong suggestions, and here's a, a fourth gentle suggestion. Um, and. Uh, one uh, response I got back, um, one, one thing that particularly hooked me, kind of surprised me, was um, the conclusion, oh, I, I get that you don't believe in entities. <laughs> I think that was a literal phrase. You don't believe in entities, which my brain is going, I, I, I think you exist. <laughs> but, the, but, but she's referring to things like demons and spirits and so on. <laughs> That's complicated. But the, the thing... It's complicated. That part wasn't relevant. This is, this is the hook that I'm wanting to point out. There's this part where I get hooked by it. Like, why, why are you viewing me that way? I don't want to be viewed that way. I don't want to be understood that way. It's important for me that you understand me differently. Why? Why is it so important? Why does it hook me? I can understand why it might make sense for me to account for the impressions that others have of me. But why does that hook me? Why does it, like a fish hook, getting in my heart and tug? Why that? 
Why that for that one? I think it's because there is an aspect of me leaning into some rescuer energy. This is in the sense of Cartman's triangle, the, the victim triangle, um, the rescuer corner of, oh, you have a bad situation, let me come in and rescue you. I was trying to be careful with that, um, but still, here I have this information and I'm going to give it to you to save you from your bad situation. Um, when that slips in uh, and I get back a reflection that is a disappreciation or that I receive as a disappreciation. I don't mean to make claims about what this other person's intention actually was, but I received it instead of as, oh, thank you so much. This is exactly right. You're so amazing, uh, which I found myself wanting to check back multiple times to see, am I getting that? Am I getting my food? Okay, when I'm doing that, there, there's the hook. I'm already hooked. I'm hooked by the act of even putting down the suggestion. So there's just this, I, I don't want to be hookable. I'm, I'm really tired of these. I'm really tired of them. It's not about <laughs> incorporeal entities or um, or questions of, are you going to listen to my ideas? Or is your magic that you claim to have trustworthy? Um, uh, is, is, is this uh, suggestion more focused on money than it is on actually helping people? And the helping people thing is something you tell yourself. Like there's, it, it, it's not about any of these. Why do I get hooked? Why do I demonize? Why do I judge? And then post-process, because I don't want to have the impact of the judgment that's already alive in me. <laughs> not only am I trying to demonize, but I'm trying to not pay the cost, feel the impact of the demonization. Um, in the case of the, I feel like I should add, um, <laughs> in the case of the conversation um, that I had earlier this evening, I didn't feel like it was full-on demonization by any means. Just these little hints of, eh, this is stupid, or eh, I don't trust that. <laughs> it was enough to make it really hard for me to relax, breathe, show up authentically with an open heart. That matters. That matters. So, there's a piece of logic that feels, I can feel dancing with my heart here. Like I, I want to be done with this. Like I, I like having the clarity of vision that lets me recognize, oh, this person is trying to trick me, or oh, that, that piece of logic doesn't make any sense. Uh, that person's confused, or that person has been possessed by a meme. I don't want that meme to possess me. The, like, I, I like having the clarity that lets me notice these things. But I'm adding a jab. That person's possessed by a meme. That meme. <sighs> that person is lesser for being infectable. <laughs> like, what's, what's with that? That's not exactly a jab. It's more like a like vomiting, like like a like a slime. Um, I can go into the why. I can explore why, but the truth is that I care a lot less about the why than I care about dropping it. I want the discernment. I don't want the judgment anymore. I don't want the grasping. I don't want this hookability. Um, it occurred to me, it occurred to me how if I had been in a position of like even just just the conversation earlier today like it was a pleasant conversation I enjoyed it I, I, I think the person on the other end of the phone enjoyed it too excuse me um, and it's not like I was totally closed you even complimented me on wow it's like so much easier to hear you it's so much easier to interact with you than it has been before 
uh, it's really a testament to the amount of growth that you've been doing. Like, yeah, thank you. And I felt really touched by that. Um, but there's something about how if I could have I'm seeing a clear vision and I'm, I'm trying to hold it and resonate with it and bring it forward. I don't want to just do it in my head and disconnect um, because there's a feeling here that I want to capture um, to the extent that my capturing it ends up being a service to you, my viewer. I would like it to be easy to feel rather than just easy to understand. The, the mind makes for a strange filter for these things. If I could have trusted, not just in my mind, but in my heart, that everything he was doing for himself was beautiful for him, everything is fine, that the modern mystery school that he's working with is doing exactly a beautiful thing. It's exactly processing everything exactly the way it needs to be processed. Um, if I, this part gets a little slippery for me to feel into, but something like if I could have trusted that my way of interacting with all of that would be guaranteed to result in the most beautiful outcome, not necessarily the one that my ego likes the best, but in something that is absolutely going to be the best outcome, because I, I can do some logic here about like my system is doing the best it can to get a, a good outcome and so is his and so is everybody else's and our dynamics of interacting produce the best result that we can given those inputs. We're all doing the best we can, but instead of having, we're all doing the best we can in a shitty situation. Instead, just assume we're all doing the best we can in reality. And this is it. And it's perfect. It's just fine. This is great. If I stop projecting my own fears and insecurities and dislikes on the world, what would that conversation have been like? What would have been possible? How much more richly could I have experienced him? Maybe maybe I actually had a gift of an insight to offer because I do have a very clear mind about a lot of things relating to mimetic possession and um, uh, the way that even the term mimetic possession has some of this energy to it. Something it's like technically correct and it needs some cleaning up. It needs some cleaning up. There's, there's this Maybe there's something that could have been perfect for him at that moment that would have unfolded. That I would have offered him, that might have graced him with, oh, I hadn't noticed I'd been thinking about it this way, and that that wasn't of service to me. Now, it's, it's easy for me to then take that and go, yeah, I messed up. And I have that kind of I messed up energy to it. It's, it's not that terrible. The conversation earlier today was quite pleasant. I really enjoyed it. I'm zooming in on the little details, the tiniest, subtle, little energetic things that are like, let me, let, let me correct this. Let me clean this up. Let me really bring all of me forward. So but there's still this inclination to go, oh, now that I notice this little bit, this, oh yeah, if I could have trusted that way, then something could have opened. And so the fact that that didn't happen, oh, right, that's being hooked. That's, that's the hook. Ah, oh, I messed up. Oh, even if I don't do that, if I go, Right? That's the emotional post-processing. The energy is still there. Ah, I messed up. Oh, this is terrible. <sighs> and 
that energy, when I take that and I paint it on the world, I then look around and I go, there's a world full of aging. There's a world full of horror of human trafficking and, and the possible weirdnesses going on with, with how all the like questions about the pandemic and people not being able to sort out the information about it. And um, like we still haven't addressed climate change and there's even disagreement is, is climate change something do aboutable? Uh, is, 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 many people are arguing about whether there even is human relevant influence into it and others are insisting how dare you how dare you even question that piece of faith and because here is our our citadel of science that affirms this that we haven't checked but we'll ignore all of that we nobody's checking anything because it's a mimetic war and the energy i just put in there that's another example right this 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 painting of everything is terrible everything is terrible it's like I'm painting the world the same way I paint my teachers when they trigger me. When, when they bring something up in me that is exactly the source of my pain and difficulty. And then, because I haven't decided to be done with it, I instead protect it by protecting wait, 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 how can I trust you? Your magic failed. How can I trust you? You're, uh, you, you, you're supposed to be teaching meditation and you grumped at me and you, you are small. <laughs> like, I don't know. I got lost an example there. Um, um, although I did have a meditation teacher who, um, who just walked up to me and just started chewing me out out of the blue. Uh, and my, my, my partner with me was like, I have no idea why he just walked up and chewed you out. <laughs> like, like, that was incredibly weird and it put a, a darkening on the whole day. And, and um, after that, I actually pulled away from that entire arc of practice. It was this form of um, meditative Aikido, meditative martial arts. And, uh, and the head teacher for the whole region like, just chewed me out. And I didn't know why, and it didn't make sense. And after that, I basically dropped the whole thing. Um, yeah, there's something funny about that, isn't there? There's something wrong here. How can a, a discipline that is focused on all of this meditative kindness and open-heartedness result in somebody walking up to me and chewing me out? Um, to this day, I, I still think he was out of line. I think that was his humanness coming out. Um, I have more room in my heart for compassion. I'm not demonizing him as much anymore, but I can feel the demon energy there. This painting of he, it, 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 it's not just, um, I think that was his own, his own issues. And he was working through them. It's he fucked up, but he fucked up as a human. That gets acceptable. It's understandable. He's a child too, a mere wrong with everything. That's wrong. This, this needs fixing. Oh, but my fixing energy needs fixing. Ah, paradox. Paradox bad. How do I deal with... Oh, paradox is good too, right? It's good and bad. That's what paradox is. Let me mess with my head. It's... There's this... There's a flip that's becoming a little more accessible to me. The, the, a naive way of describing the flip would be Actually, this is heaven. This is heaven. Everything is beautiful, perfect. This is exquisite. And everything I am experiencing that isn't in alignment with that is me painting pieces of hell I have brought with me. But I think it's out here. I think it's out here. I see it is out here. Right? There really is human trafficking. Isn't that terrible? <sighs> well, this is not to deny the existence of human trafficking or that there is terribleness to it. But there's something funny that's going on here. Something about 
like like judgment and demonization are two different processes but they're th right now in me they're fused so what does it mean to see everything as perfect and beautiful and to look at something like human trafficking and not demonize it and look at that and say I want to change that I feel rage towards it I feel a sense of like this is not something that I personally emotionally grappled with a lot so it doesn't feel personal to me I haven't encountered it um, it, it just feel, it feels like a drop in the bucket compared to the horror of aging but um, <clears throat> the um but there's a there's something here I, I just feel the edge of it of what would it be to peel back all of the condemnation to view everything every time i see anything in the mirror that is the world that is a value judgment of this is bad and i think the symmetric thing is also true I judge it as good. Man, this ice cream is delicious. Man, this, like this, this whole conversation. This is a good conversation. If, if if instead of viewing these as things that are out here, if I peel them back, sort of grab grab the wallpaper and peel it back, and I can just see reality, and I can see that all of these judgments, these energies are properties of me. There's a, there's kind of a, I don't know, a solipsistic psychedelic version of the, what, what the then is. Like, if I can do this, then there's like a solipsistic version. And there's a mechanical version that is inconsistent. It's paradoxical. Um, the mechanical version goes something like, I think that if I can do that, then I, the, the kind of energy that I bring to my interactions with all beings is just clean. There's no hooking and there's no hookability. There's no manipulation. So all of the manipulative noise that creates all of the difficulties that we see in the world, this um, it just slides off of me. I am fully immune. I've experienced increasing degrees of immunity, but it feels sort of like I've gone from 2% to 3% to 4%, and there's some sort of switch that I can feel of this is giving me practice for figuring out what hooks are and for ending the ability to be hooked. Just done. I want that. If I can show up that way, I expect that the care that I experience and the deep trust, oh, you're doing your work and you're doing your work. And the work that we're each doing to like dissolve and shift the energies, this is perfect and this is beautiful exactly where we are. Absolute sovereignty, absolute trust in the sovereignty of every being. And I am not to judge yours. If I can bring that, then it helps to center others in the same kind of unhookable space. Because if, among other things, if the hooks don't work on me, then there's no point in using them. And they have to get a taste of what kind of interaction is hookless. But also it's just, it's merciful, it's easy, it's expansive. It's kind, there's room for the hearts to connect. No extra gains, no extra weird shuffly stuff in the middle. So there's a pleasantness. It doesn't mean it's right for every person right where they are, but it's right for every person for whom it's right. <laughs> um, but there's a, um, the reason it's paradoxical, um, the reason it has an inconsistency in that is because in order to describe that with a sense of, well, that happens and then the world gets cleaned up and we, we create a good world and this actually becomes heaven, is that it presumes that there's something wrong with how things are now such that by my making this shift to pretending that things are good, that will cause things to actually become good. But the pretending is based on trying to see reality more clearly. So there's something 
logically glitchy that happens there? Like what's the actual goal? I think the reason is it's that description is not internally consistent in the arc of getting there. I think the internal thing is something like the reason, and this is more the solipsistish thing, the reason there are horrors in the world is because there are horrors in me. I am projecting them into the world and then not recognizing that they're not in the world, they're in me. That's a reflection of me. So if I can own the part of me that I'm seeing in this strange mirror as human trafficking, as uh, issues with climate change, as this political insanity, as people dying of old age, if I can look at that and see how that is a reflection, not, not just the phenomenon, but my attitude towards it, like that at like how what I'm seeing in the mirror is actually a reflection of me and my judgment of it is a judgment of myself. If I can take that and really work with it, then the world will change because I will have instead of trying to trying to um, clean the muddy face in the mirror by wiping the mirror more, I'm wiping the my face, which cleans the face in the mirror. That's consistent. It's a little strange to talk about, well, how does that, like, how does my doing this actually deal with things like human trafficking? And then we go into the mechanisms of the thing that sounds kind of inconsistent. I bet there's a way to make it more consistent. I bet there is. There's something here that feels um, rooted. Like it's on the edge of where feeling the beginnings of a meaningful answer to the question, how do I be unhookable? Actually unhookable. Cool. I feel like that was my main piece. Um, see, David Swedlow has popped in. Hello. Um, says, Cartman's Triangle has a grabbiness ideal for hooking that is individually and collectively very powerful, and it acts as social binding agent. Yeah. Um, also seeable, metaphorically, as Velcro hooks and loops. <laughs> I start to notice that I can develop a capacity to relax my hook material, or release my loopy hoops to modulate the impact of Cartman's triangle. Demonizing seems to strengthen the hookiness and reduce my agency to relax the attachment. There is both wonder and horror in seeing of the mechanism. Yeah. I just really relate. I relate to all that. I agree. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, a whole lot of what I was talking about back in August was, um, like it's, it's sort of funny to view it this way, but I think this is correct. Um, I haven't thought about this too carefully, but I think it's still correct. Um, a lot of what I was describing back in August is, huh, sure looks to me like um, our entire culture is based on keeping everybody in the victim triangle and basing culture on it. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are some important nuances that are missed in that, and particularly all the stuff about mimetic evolution um, and what it feels like on the inside, how that results in the structure of identity and so on. Um, but like in terms of an 80-20, um, yeah. So yeah, I, I relate quite well to what you're talking about um, act, and, and when you're talking about how it acts as a social binding agent. Um, I would go a little farther and say, I think the entire modern world is built on the foundation of people hooking each other this way. Like speed limit signs, <laughs> like speed limits, 60 miles an hour on the freeway. Like that, this is like in, in a kind world, speed limit signs, would not be threats. They would be um, letting you know this is this is the speed that works here. And what would happen is if people were, if somebody speeds at a dangerous 
rate through that area, like they're going 75, 80 miles an hour, um, they would get pulled over by certainly by a police officer, but the police officer's training would focus on compassionate connection. Not necessarily making the person feel good, but checking and saying, hey, you were in a hurry, what's going on? Like for one thing, is there an emergency? Is there an actual emergency that for some reason the emergency system couldn't hold? And if so, is there a way to deal with the emergency that doesn't create more emergencies? <laughs> um, and if it's just I don't know, it's like a teenager who's not plugged into cultural sense-making. And it's something like, okay, kid, well, here's the thing. You can't do that. It hurts too many people, including you. And so, and then it, it, we would need more cultural mechanisms in place, but there, there'd be something of, um, not as punishment, but as, hey, is there a way to help educate this kid in feeling, not just knowing, not just feeling scared about obeying, but feeling the meaningfulness of respecting the common speed. So 60 miles per hour would then become something like, this is the speed that we have noticed works well here. This is the default. It's, it's the shelling point to use a, um, well, it, it becomes the shelling point by it being, by there being a sign. But, um, I mean, it's a technical term that's not that important. Um, like that, that's a kind world. That moves in the direction of creating an infrastructure that is based in kindness. And that's just one small example. Um, so uh, the, the fact that we live in a world that is based on threat and obligation and punishment as its corrective mechanisms. Yeah. Um, like it's understandable that we ended up here, but the net effect is still a whole lot of victim triangles, the foundation of culture, <laughs> which I'm judging. <laughs> this is so insidious. The, making the distinction between describing, here are the mechanisms I see, and noticing the slightest hint, even the, even the very subtlest thing in my heart of, and this sucks and this other thing would be better. It's just like, I'm a little, I'm a little disoriented because there's something of like, that I think it would be better. I, I do want that other one, <laughs> but, uh, but not to judge, not to like, there's this extra jab. This is a place where I feel like I haven't quite nailed the articulation. I can feel the difference sometimes, but it's a little confused in my heart still. Um, and David adds, agree with mimetic evolution. The mechanism seems to include social and individual tipping points that result in gradual cascades of development a la spiral dynamics or Keegan's levels, etc. Yeah, I think of those as emergent phenomena the same way that uh, technically, um, basically all of biological evolution amounts to DNA evolution or gene evolution, um, at least according to the standard theory of it. Uh, but somehow the fact that there are humans talking and thinking has utterly dominated over the nature of most genes, even though technically they're arising from genes. But yeah, it's an order of complexity. Um, there, there's emergent behavior that starts to dominate over the levels that were there before. Um, we certainly don't worry too much about the cellular evolution, except when it becomes really loud along the lines of cancer, for instance. Cancer is a form of cellular evolution that goes, you know what, screw you, upper levels of emergent stuff. Um, the frustration is evidence one is near a tipping point. Uh, I, I think I'm, I probably mentioned frustration, um, but I'm a little lost as what you're talking about. <laughs> um, but um, Yeah, I think that is all that I really have to say here. So thanks for listening. Thanks for, for jumping in and, and offering your points, David. I just need to get your input here. Hmm. Okay, and I will see whoever shows up here tomorrow. <laughs>